Hi, uh, good evening. My name is Manny. Uh, I'm a fifth year integrated vascular surgery resident uh, here at Houston Methodist. And I have with me my colleague, uh, Philip Ayang. Uh, he is also a fifth year integrated vascular surgery resident at Houston Methodist. And tonight uh, we're going to talk a little bit about residency and the application uh, process and what applicants should be looking for in um, their applications to integrated vascular residency. Our plan tonight was to have a couple of attendings um, and a few of other residents. Uh, at the moment, as is the nature of vascular surgery and the unexpected nature of vascular surgery, they're currently stuck in the operating room and so we'll have to be waiting for them and they may trickle into the show um, as we go. But uh, we're gonna start uh, with uh, Philip and kind of get his take on what's important in vascular surgery training. So right now, uh, applicants have probably submitted their applications and later this uh, month here in October, the programs will start to review the applications and November, December, January is where kind of the interviews kick off and where most programs schedule their interviews. Our interview here at uh, Methodist will be in early December and then another one in early January. Obviously with this COVID situation, it's a little bit different this year and most programs will be having the interviews uh, be uh, virtual, which makes it even more important to get to know programs in other ways uh, since a lot of applicants won't be able to come and visit this program. So I'm going to start with just a very basic uh, question, uh, Philip. So first, what, what should applicants be focused on when evaluating a potential training program? Sure, yeah. Thanks for the introduction. Um, the, yeah, I think like first and foremost, the, what you want to know is the case volume and the breadth of vascular cases because, I mean, that's the most important thing in training. So you, you, you really want to know what cases that they do. Are they lacking any certain thing at that institution? Because it's actually a pretty wide array of what different institutions do. Some institutions don't do any dialysis access. Uh, places like Methodist, we do a lot of dialysis access. And so certain places just, and you see that amongst all the hospitals and the way that different groups cover different things like interventional radiology or cardiology. Are they doing peripheral interventions? Are they doing venous interventions or visceral interventions? And um, those are the kind of questions you need to ask at each program and kind of get an idea of, of what they cover and what you're going to get exposed to because, I mean, as a trainee, you want to see everything and you want to be prepared uh, because that's the goal is to be prepared when you're on your own. So I think that's probably the number one thing to look at, um, you know, when you're trying to evaluate programs. Yeah, that's a great point. Case volume and, and, and the breadth and depth of cases. Yeah. What's your recommendation for applicants as they're interviewing? How do they find out about a, a program's case volume? And, and how do they find out whether a program's case volume is adequate? Because, you know, when you're a fourth year medical student, uh, they throw up a chart and yeah. you kind of look at it and you're like, oh, I don't know, is that is you know is, is 100 open aortas okay? Is five open aortas okay? I don't know what what's a, what's an adequate yeah. case volume. What do you recommend? Um, so you can find the actual requirements I think on the ACGME. So sorry, I'm also on call, so that's also the way of vascular. Um, I'll give that call a bit real quick, but um, you yeah so. I think the best way to figure that out is actually to talk to the residents that are already in the program. You know, you go to the places, you talk to attendings, they're always gonna say something and they're gonna make it seem like a nicer thing, but actually talking to the residents, you get a real idea of what's going on at that program in terms of what they're doing. And you can even ask them, what are you lacking? What do you feel like you're lacking in your training at this program? And most of them are pretty honest about it. So, you know, right now in this COVID time, you may not have that interaction with the residents. I know that our program, we're gonna to try to have an online interaction with um, interviewees just and just residents. But even if you can't, I would reach out to the program coordinator and say, hey, can I get contacts for, this, for some of your residents and see if you just reach out and say, you know, can I have a phone call with you? And I'm sure they're more than happy to, to set aside time and, and discuss these things and ask those hard questions and, and they'll, they'll tell you what, what's really going on. Yeah, those are, those are all great um, points. And uh, you mentioned kind of the, the volume of cases. 
But um, one thing that's kind of known out there is that some programs are known to get their juniors in the OR early, mm -hmm. whereas some programs are more top heavy where the juniors spend a lot of time on the floor, seeing consults, um, kind of taking care of floor patients, and the seniors are the ones that operate. Uh, what do you think about that, and, and how important do you think it's, it is to have um, early exposure to the operating room? Yeah, um, I think for an integrated track, it is very important. Uh, I mean, you have to learn how to do both. You need to know how to take care of patients and see consults, so you can't overlook that. And we all want to operate, and we all want to do that, of course. Um, but getting in early and, and kind of learning how to dissect and do anastomoses at the basic level is always nice. Um, so it is important and, you know, going to a program that in general allows you to have that kind of autonomy is important and, uh, but you'll get it across all. I mean, I know a lot of programs, some do like traditional where you're pretty much only the floor for the first two years, but do they balance that out in later in your training to uh, operate more or is it more longitudinal like in our program where it's, you know, longitudinal and we do a lot of you know, clinical and operating throughout all five years. So uh, it's definitely an advantage if you can start operating early though, like hands down. I don't think all programs are like that. Um, not necessarily that they're worse, but um, you know, just different paradigms and, and different ways to look at it. Are there certain cases that you feel if a program is heavy in, in that area, the, the juniors will end up operating more? Um, versus uh, other case, cases yeah. where the... Definitely uh, dialysis. Dialysis is like the, great, the greatest training ground for, for junior residents. And so you get the opportunity to learn how to dissect in a non-high stakes area where it's the arm where there's not too much to mess up. I mean, of course you can, but it's a fairly simple anatomy. It's not too deep. And you also get a chance to you know, learn how to use castros and work with fine sutures, 6-0s, 7-0s and just kind of really practice and hone in on using your loops and kind of getting the dexterity you need to do vascular surgery. Because once you do the small stuff, you can do the big stuff pretty easily, right? As you can probably, you know, in your experience. Yeah, that, that was actually uh, something that I w was blown away with when I came to Houston Methodist for training because I expected, you know, coming from a university, more traditional program, I was expecting that um, I would show up and, and essentially not operate for the first few years of my residency. I was expecting to come in and uh, to be exclusively managing patients on the floor or going to clinic. And what I was shocked by is when I showed up to Houston Methodist was um, we have such an enormous dialysis access uh, case volume uh, and focus uh, that our juniors from the first day they come here, they start operating and they start doing vascular surgery, not just operating. You know, our juniors are not just uh, doing INDs and growing washouts and wound vac exchanges, but our interns on their first day are doing anastomoses. And so I got to start doing real anastomoses on a patient when I was, you know, a week into residency. And I think that really laid the foundation for my training so that you know, being able to do a radiocephalic fistula or a brachiocephalic fistula, um, how that translates to being able to do a fempop or um, a, a carotid is, is not, it's not too distant. Obviously, the anatomy is different, the exposure is different, and the stakes are different, but the dexterity and, and um, the muscle memory is, is, is quite similar. And so that was, I think, a really important thing for me is, yeah. is having that early experience as a junior and that dialysis access as a junior, yeah. um, which... And I like that distinction that you made. Some programs, they have you do purely general surgery for the first two years or 18 to 24 months, and then your last three years, 36 months, you're doing vascular. And, you know, it's just by way of it, you're integrated, they're general surgery, and, you know, you're just not treated the same way. And you also, like you said, you get exposed to more uh, gluteal abscesses and lap PDs and lap um, inguinal hernia or hernia repairs, which you never do, and, and you can learn things from those cases absolutely, but it's it's not quite as translatable um, if you're doing vascular cases from the beginning of your training to uh, to the end, you become really really comfortable, and that's where there is an advantage in the integrated over the general surgery and traditional tract is. You're sewing from the beginning. You're sewing, learning how to sew anastomosis. So, 
that is a question I would ask programs. You know, how do they break up their general surgery months with their vascular? How much vascular are they doing in their early years uh, versus later years? So uh, I think that's an important distinction. Yeah, so definitely, you know, for, for those applicants out there who are interviewing and looking at programs, if, if, if you're looking to kind of get uh, a running start and start operating early, uh, look for programs that have a, a, a robust dialysis access because generally these are cases that the senior residents uh, may not be as interested in doing. Um, if you have, you know, a fem distal or a fem pop or a carotid or an aorta or a common femoral endarectomy, you're going to have uh, seniors that are very much interested in doing those cases because they're more complex and they don't have as many of those cases. Uh, if you have a radiocephalic fistula and you have, or, 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 or a navy graft, um, a lot of the seniors are going to either take you through the case and do it with you and let you do a large part of it, or they're not going to be interested at all to, to, to be a part mm -hmm. of the case, and you may be left alone. And so um, th those are all great, um, great p points and uh, good advice. So moving on a little bit, another thing that always comes up when people are applying to any surgical field is the issue of autonomy. So, autonomy, what does it mean to you, Philip? Tell me what autonomy means to you and how does it affect your training? Yeah, I, I think autonomy has kind of changed as you go through your, your, your or you progress through your, your residency. When you're first an intern, you want to learn how to sew and you want to learn how to do those anastomosis with cash shows and then you realize that that's actually the easiest part and then you start to develop and you mature and you realize you need to learn how to dissect and learn how to expose. And then, and then finally, it's how to retract. And so you slowly continue to evolve and realize what's important, and you begin to hone in on those things. And then lastly, it's, and then what I've now realized as in a, you know, almost completing your training is, is looking at the nuances and the small things that your attendings do to make everything so nice. Because when you start to do things on your own and have that autonomy and the attendings give you that and you make the mistakes and you look like a fool, <laughs> that's where you learn that the small things matter a lot. And so, you know, it's a continuous build. You, you start off just learning your basics. How do you sew? How do you dissect? How do you use your scissors and mets and, and ligating things and tying things off? But then as you progress, you learn and you learn more by making mistakes. And I think autonomy now when I look at it is the opportunity to make the mistakes in the operating room. And that's how you grow as a surgeon and learn how to become more facile and how to how to just become a lot more streamlined in what you do. So I think autonomy is, is the attendings giving you the opportunity to make mistakes in the operating room. I think that's how I look at it now. Those are, those are great points. And not, not only in the OR, but outside of the OR, because, you know, autonomy also extends to the management of patients postoperatively and preoperatively. Um, as, as you all know, those people that are applying to vascular surgery, Vascular surgery is a beautiful field because there's a million ways to tackle one problem. And if you ask, you know, five vascular surgeons how they would approach a single problem, they will give you usually five different answers. And so mm -hmm. having the ability, your attendings giving you that ability to make those management calls and, and make those uh, operative calls uh, is, is huge in vascular surgery because it really makes you think. And instead of just executing the plan that somebody may have come up with, you get to come up with your own plans and see those plans being executed and carried out. Yeah. How do you gauge this though? You know, you're interviewing, you're an applicant, you're going to all these interviews. How do you know, oh, um, you know, this program, they're going to give me lots of autonomy or this program, I'm going to kind of be um, kind of just watching people operate or, or, or be on the, on the sidelines. How, yeah. What do you think? To be honest, it is hard. It is really hard to gauge that. Um, and I think all I can say is back up what I said earlier is try to reach out to the intern, the third year, the, the chief there, and just try to ask the same questions and ask them what they don't like about their program or what do they feel like is missing from their program or how's the autonomy um, as an intern, as a third year, as a chief year, and see what they say. I think that's, the, that's probably your best place to find true answers is probably through the residents in that program. I don't know, do you, can you think of anybody else that you can talk to or reach out to? No, I, I think that's huge. I think it's just about um, talking to those residents and sometimes reading between the lines. Um, obviously, when you ask a current resident how they feel, a lot of times they'll tell you, oh, everything's fine. But uh, you can get a sense. Um, I think good questions to ask are, um, 
things like, tell me about uh, a case you did recently and how did it go? What parts of it did you do? Mm -hmm. um, so that they can be specific, you know, uh, if somebody uh, says, somebody can easily say, oh, you know, yeah, we have great autonomy, everything's fine in the OR. Um, but somebody who can actually go through and say, oh, you know, I did, you know, last week I did an aorta biofem and I, you know, exposed a common femoral, I exposed the aorta, I clamped the aorta, I sewed the proximal anastomosis, I did the tunneling. If they're very specific about things, then I think it's a lot more credible and, and, and you can get a sense that these, these residents um, also, uh, you know, have, have a good autonomy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, now, you know, there was a study published in Journal of Vascular Surgery in 2016 that predicted that by 2020, uh, most integrated vascular surgery trainees were going to graduate having done only about three uh, open aneurysm repairs during their entire training. Uh, wow. Now, you know, that's a, a pretty uh, grim view of Sad. the future, and that was in 2016. Um, and it hasn't quite turned out to be that bad. Um, obviously, as we all know, with EVAR and, and EVAR becoming more and more common uh, as, as we go along, and now with the fenestrated and branched endografts, open aneurysm repairs have become less and less uh, common in, in basket surgery in general and specifically in training programs. And, uh, you know, I was looking at the data from uh, 2019 from the ACGME case log and um, in 2019, those uh, residents that graduated, this for integrated residents only, not including fellows, um, <clears throat> most of them, uh, the average uh, national number of open AAA repairs was about seven uh, as chiefs for uh, their entire training. And the average uh, mesenteric bypass, and this includes celiac bypass and SMA bypass, the average a uh, resident who graduated in 2019 finished with uh, only one chief level mesenteric bypass during their entire training. Uh, tell me about open vascular experience. How important is it? Does it matter? Uh, do these numbers concern you uh, when you yeah. when you look at Yeah, I mean, it's definitely concerning um, because you know, there's always there's always a place for open vascular surgery no matter what. And, I mean, now there's going to be more stents, but then there's endo, like, um, endo leaks that they can't control or the sac is continue to uh, expand or infection. I think infection is one of the main drivers for you know keeping open surgery alive. Uh, anytime you have an infection of an endograft or a prior open or a prior graft that needs to be ex explanted and, you, and those are even more tough than a straightforward you know primary aortic repair because everything's inflamed and nasty and difficult to dig out. So um, I think Going to a place that is a tertiary center where you get a lot of referrals from other places for complicated things is, is very important, especially from the trainee perspective. But then again, it's also what do you want to get out of training? Do you want to be private practice and you're okay with doing kind of the more basic stuff and endovascular, but if you feel like you do want to tackle every part of vascular surgery, then you need to go to a program where at least you get the uh, exposure to it. and then. And then you can branch out and out in your practice to find who you want to be in that. But if you want to keep things open, you want to have as much of a breadth as possible. So it's concerning. Um, like you said, I mean, the pendulum swings and it's still coming back. They're, they're still feel, finding that there's inadequacies of endovascular repairs. And so, um, you know, learning it all is very important. It's just part of being a confident vascular surgeon. Um, just feeling like you can handle anything that comes through the door when you're on call. So. Um, yeah, it's it's concerning, but you know I think as you as you continue in your as an attending, you you it's a continuation of your education too. You're not done after you graduate, really, and that's kind of how you feel. You just hope that you're trained well enough that you can, you know, be somewhat confident. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's that's really a great point. Is um, you kind of said you want to make sure you know what kind of attending you want to be um, because that's important uh, if, 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 if you know you're going to want to be a, you know a, an attending that does a lot of open aortic surgery or does a lot of carotids you probably want to go to a training program where that is one of their focus and you will leave there being well trained because it's um, not easy to pick these things up you know if, if, if you did uh, five 
open aneurysm repairs in five years of training, it, it's not going to be super simple to just go out and practice and, and start doing you know open aneurysm repairs yeah. uh, unless you have the right setup or you have senior partners who are going to support you through this. But in general, this is not usually the case. Um, yeah. And so that that's very important. But the, the reality is, is we don't really know what vascular surgery is going to be like. It's It's such a uh, a rapidly evolving field that mm -hmm. um, in 10, 20, 30 years from now, we have no idea what the field would be like. Like you said, there's a pendulum and it, it's always swinging and it, it, it may be that uh, we continue going more and more endo and, and things become more and more complex endovascularly, which is, is a likely scenario, but the other possible scenario is that the pendulum starts to swing the other way and that uh, we start finding that these endovascular solutions to, to these problems are not as durable uh, as we as we may have thought and now we require somebody with the expertise to do open surgery and so that's a huge I think thing when when our applicants are out there interviewing and looking at programs is to look at a program that really does everything and really kind of covers from A to Z and uh, they train you to do both open and endovascular surgery. And th I think the way you check that is, is, is you really want to ask programs to provide their case logs mm -hmm. of their graduating residents as well. You want to look at those. And it, it, it shouldn't be like, um, it shouldn't be like, oh, there's one slide up that's on there for five seconds and you get to look at it real quick and then it passes. It, it should be, I think the applicants have the right to, to have uh, access to the case logs of the senior graduating residents to make sure that they're getting um, uh, going to a place that's going to train them well. Mm -hmm. uh, another question here is fellows or no fellows? So there's programs out there like ours that have um, chosen to keep their integrated residency and also their fellows. Uh, and we have found that this is very valuable um, and that the fellows add a lot to um, our trainees. Uh, and we, we feel that this is very important. Uh, but there's other programs that don't have fellows. What do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, coming from a program that has fellows, I, I feel like it's not been a problem for us from the integrated tract. I mean, like you said, it's more of a collegial atmosphere and you can learn stuff from them than they can, and they learn stuff from us because they don't have as much experience. Uh, it just matters then what's the case volume at your, at your institution. If the case volume is so low that everyone's double scrubbing, like the integrated chiefs are double scrubbing with the fellows and scrubbing with the attendings, and there's multiple attendings in each case, then that's a problem. If they're busy enough where a fellow's operating on one aorta and the, and the integrated chiefs are operating on another aorta somewhere else, then, then it's, it's, it's all gravy. So it kind of depends on the case volume. Case volume, uh, very key. So it looks like we have uh, Dr. Tony Liu. Uh, Dr. Liu, can you hear us? Yeah. Hey. Hey. Thanks hey, for having me, guys. Sorry, I was running a little late in the clinic. No problem. Uh, we were just talking about you know how busy vascular surgery can be and how unexpected and and uh, it's it's hard to get everybody together at the same time because everybody has uh, such busy schedules. So Dr. Liu is a graduate from uh, the Methodist Integrated Vascular Surgery Program. Uh, he graduated in 2018. Is that right? Yep. 2018, um, and he went to me medical school at Texas A&M, and then came uh, and trained with us, and then he went off and, and was a uh, academic faculty uh, at Baylor at the VA, and worked there for uh, a while, and is now back with us as, as one of our faculty, uh, and is working at one of our uh, peripheral ho hospitals in Sugarland, uh, Texas. So welcome, Dr. Liu. Thanks. Thanks for having me. So we're, we're talking a little bit about um, what trainees should be looking for uh, in programs. And you have obviously been an attending already uh, for a couple of years. And so you have that perspective, which I think is very valuable. Uh, so I'm, I'm going to kind of direct some of these questions uh, to you, Dr. Liu. And what, um, what things should uh, people who are applying to vascular surgery this year and who will be interviewing in the next few months what things should they focus on when evaluating a potential training program and uh, choosing uh, a, a training program? Well, I think this year is a little bit odd, right, because of COVID and everything else. So most of the interviews are being done all virtual. Um, so it's particularly difficult this year, I think, but just kind of talking to the residents and 
I think the residents and the fellows tell you a lot about what's going on at the program. Um, I think there's a nice balance between, you know, case plan, like having having enough cases so that everyone's busy. And I kind of caught the tail end of what you guys were talking about there before with whether or not, um, you know, it's a pro or a con to have fellows in the program. But I think what you should be looking for is a program where, you know, everyone is collegial and, you know, you have time to have face-to-face -face time with the attendings um, so that you can do your preoperative planning and talk about cases beforehand. Um, but you also don't want that to be kind of the only thing you do. You want to be for it to be busy enough and looking at the case logs that the programs present to kind of see, you know, what they have and how busy they are so that you have a good variety as well as a number of cases. So, you know, you want a program that, you know, does a little bit of everything because you never know exactly what you're going to, you know, come out of training from and what kind of practice you'd be joining. And I'm fairly early on in my you know career, so I'm definitely still learning. And you know, this is my second practice. And I'd say this practice is pretty different from the practice I joined immediately out of training, which is pretty different from <laughs> the the training program we're all we were all a part of. Yeah. So we were just talking uh, just before you joined us. One of the topics was open vascular experience and how important it is. Uh, that I, was, I mentioned there was an article published in 2016 that kind of predicted um, open aortic repairs and, and where those were going in training. And they predicted that by 2020, uh, most trainees uh, in integrated vascular surgery would graduate with uh, about three open aortic uh, aneurysm repairs uh, in their entire training. And now, looking at the actual numbers now, um, they're not quite that grim. So in 2019, um, most uh, most people had more than that, and the average number of open aortic uh, aneurysm repairs was about seven uh, in terms of chief level, uh, logged as a surgeon chief. Uh, how important do you think looking at open uh, vascular experience, uh, how important is, is it to look at that when choosing a training program? You're, you know, you're now an attending, and uh, you, you have kind of two practices that you've experienced, both at the VA and now at a community hospital. Do you feel that it's crucial that uh, trainees train somewhere where, where with a robust, open vascular experience, or do you think that's not as important as people may make it out to seem? I think it's an important experience to have for sure because, you know, I'd say it's it's a struggle with every program, and you know, it's a it's a struggle that I hear from. Being on the academic side of things, it's it's a struggle for everyone to get their numbers to actually to meet the numbers of open aortic cases or open abdominal cases. But it's it's one of the it's something that you definitely want to look for in a program when you're looking for a program because you don't because the cases will still come and, and it's not like the cases aren't out there and you you don't want the like the open abdomen that you have to do as an attending to be like your third or fourth open abdomen. I don't. I think the numbers look a little bit more grim, and I feel like in everything I've seen, we've the fortunately for the two institutions I've been a part of, both you know, Arch Institution and training and the academic institution I trained, um, I joined after my training. The numbers weren't that bad, and everyone made their numbers. So the numbers are definitely still there from what I've seen, um, at least in the the programs I've been a part of. But you know that's open abdominal. I think with the open you know peripheral cases, that's definitely still there. Um, they just become harder and harder open peripheral cases. It's peripheral cases that are like we don't see very many fem pops or um, just plain fem tibs. Even it's usually you know the fem pops um, are becoming femoral um, angioplasties. Since the fem tibials you usually reduce. Um, sometimes, or it's like fem tibial with um, arm vein because they have no leg vein. It's just, it's become more difficult. And, you know, you don't want the redo abdomen aerobifem to be your, like, first aerobifem out of practice. And you don't want it to be your fourth one ever either. <laughs> so I think it's definitely something important. It's something you should, you know, be able to do and look for in a program. Yeah, that, those, are, those are all great points. How, how about the, the counter argument? Um, how about complex endo? Do you do you want to go? Um, do you think it's crucial or very important for applicants to look at programs that are doing a lot of complex endovascular uh, procedures, uh, like fenestrated and branched endografts and carotid stenting and, and things like that? Are 
Are those things, once you get out in practice, really important? Or are those things that's something that you can pick up with time if, if you choose to? I think a lot of that, the technology is still developing out there, like fenestrated graphs. You know, there's only really one company that makes fenestrated graphs right now. And you have other companies starting with trials for different kinds of devices that aren't fenestrated, but they're branch devices that work in those areas. I think the technology is evolving there. So as long as you have good endovascular skills, it's something more that you can develop um, over time. Um, you know, I think that we all love these fancy complex cases, but realistically, when we when you finish, <laughs> it's not necessarily the first case or the first few cases that you want to do. And you know, it's it's not outside of big academic centers, at least in the community practice I'm not a part of, it's not something that comes around that often. Um, so I think that as long as you have developed good basic innovator skills, it's great that if you're exposed to that, but I, you know, I wouldn't seek out a program just for that purpose, but that, that would be my opinion. I guess that's based on your interests, right? If you're going to vascular surgery because you want to push the boundaries on endovascular, you want to go somewhere that has staff that is specialized in that. And so I think getting to know the staff that are at the institution and what they, they specialize in is important uh, if you're gearing yourself towards something particular vascular. Yeah, knowing, knowing yourself and kind of what your goals are, which is not easy um, for medical students, obviously especially in a field like vascular surgery where we're evolving so fast that, you know, if somebody told me I'm going into vascular surgery because I want to be a fenestrated yeah. endograft guy, well, I would say, you know, that may not be enough of a reason to go into vascular surgery right. because right. those may be completely gone or completely different by the time you finish training. And so uh, I think f for those people that are considering a field in vascular surgery, I would say uh, fall in love with all aspects of the field, and if you can follow up with the patient population, with the disease process, the patients will all be, always be the same patients, um, and the disease uh, processes and, and the pathology will always be the same, but the way we treat these diseases and, and the way we approach the problems is going to be uh, ever-evolving and, and continue to evolve. So that's, uh, that's very important. Uh, the, other, the other thing that, that I've noticed is that different uh, programs have different rotations for their trainees. Uh, for example, our, our program feels very strongly that uh, being exposed to the community and being exposed to smaller hospitals is very important for our trainees. And so we send our trainees out to the community um, and it, we feel that that provides them not only a different view of vascular surgery. Uh, it's it's nice to be away from a tertiary care center where you're actually seeing more of the bread and butter of vascular surgery. Uh, that way, uh, when you go out into practice, you're not completely shocked by your practice and, and thinking, you know, everything's going to be the same as it was in the tertiary care center. But it also gives uh, a one-on-one -on -one interaction where, with attendings where our junior residents, for example, we send a lot of our third-year residents out to the community because... When our third-year residents are at the medical center, uh, they have fourth and fifth-year residents ahead of them that kind of get to pick cases as they see fit and do cases as they see fit. And so a lot of times they don't get the first choice pick for cases. When our third-year residents are out in the community, it's just them and an attending or them and three attendings or two attendings, and they get to do every single case. Um, they get to you know see every consult, uh, go to clinic, and they get to choose, pick and choose. If there's an aorta going on at the same time as a leg angio, they're gonna you know choose aorta or a carotid, and and we feel that that's very valuable. Um, other places have uh, other programs have locations like the VA where they get a little bit of a different flavor and a different experience of what vascular surgery is. Uh, Dr. L Dr. Liu, do you think that's important to have a place where you have a lot of variety in the training places, or do you think having more of a centralized location where there's just one hospital and that's where you train is, is more uh, valuable? Oh, I think I like the variety, and that's one of the things that I looked for when I was selecting my training program to begin with. And I, you know, I like the, the programs of the different sites and the different rotations. Um, in the different settings too. I know when we've definitely developed our community program more and since uh, really since I've graduated and since I was even I was there too, we started going out. 
uh, more. But I think the different training sites definitely help. You see different patient populations, you see different practice patterns. And, you know, one of the things that you never really see as a resident, or at least I didn't see very much of, was just kind of practice building. And, um, and you definitely see that more in the community, which might be more applicable depending on the type of practice you eventually choose to go to. Yeah, and, and that's so important, the whole practice building aspect of vascular surgery, because while, you know, a lot of us may want to become big academic uh, vascular surgeons and, and go to, uh, you know, a, a major institution, a tertiary care center, the reality is, if you look at statistics, is that most of us will end up in the community. And so not having any exposure to community hospitals, to periphery hospitals, to building practice, I think is a huge disadvantage for, for trainees. Uh, what do you think, Philip? Yeah, I definitely think that it's twofold, as you mentioned, just to highlight those things is, number one, it's a good window into what your potential future practice can be or what your options are out there. And then, yeah, two, it's it's a great opportunity to grow as a resident and become autonomous and more confident in yourself as you progress to chief level years as a four and a five. So having that opportunity as a three to go out there and operate on your own with these attendings and not having other uh, senior level residents taking cases uh, is a great opportunity. So it's twofold for sure. Moving on a little bit to rotation. So I obviously, in vascular surgery training, you're gonna rotate through general surgery. That's a requirement. You're gonna rotate through vascular surgery for most of your training, uh, obviously. But uh, there's also other rotations that are somewhat electives. And I, I, for me, one of the most valuable rotations during my junior years was the neurology rotation. We do a lot of carotids. Um, and doing a carotid without having any kind of idea of how to look at a MRI and what a diffusion-weighted uh, MRI is and uh, what a, the, the protocol for a stroke is and, and you know, what the dose for TPA is and all that stuff, having no idea about that and, and just doing carotids, I think, is, is a disservice to trainees. Are there other rotations uh, that, that um, Dr. Liu, that you think that are very crucial for integrated vascular surgery trainees and that um, these uh, applicants should be looking for in their future programs? I mean, I think that besides neurology, just kind of the other services that we interact on with on kind of a frequent basis, I really like my cardiology rotation as a junior level resident um, and just working with them and working with the um, interventional neuroradiologists um, I think that some programs have a radiology rotation, which is pretty important for us because, because we spend a lot of time reviewing CTs and um, MRs even, and then uh, definitely x-rays. So um, those type of rotations with a lot of crossovers from our daily practice is important. I think that, you know, kind of on the other side of things, a part of a vascular practice that I didn't see much at the VA and now in the community hospital is like our trauma rotation. I thought that was a good rotation as well, and just to be, that might be more towards the general surgery side of things, but, you know, just for vascular trauma, it's kind of hard to find vascular trauma, but it's definitely an interest for some people. Yeah. I'd have to yeah. add, though, that rotations are highly dependent on your chief residents and the attendings on that service, so you could be a great rotation, but if you have a chief that, you know, doesn't really is not a great chief or doesn't is not invested in your learning, it, it can quickly become a pretty bad rotation. So again, getting insight into people who've actually rotated on those and what they like is important. So it could be a great rotation, but if you're just treated like a junior resident and only scudding and doing things like that, then it could go from a good rotation to a very bad rotation, just even the matter of from month to month. Because we've had a lot of changes in rotations and what works and what doesn't. And we've gone back and forth. We've gone adding this rotation, taking it away, adding it back. So you need a little bit more insight into that. But definitely having a breadth, larger breadth, you know, including neurology, cardiology, and just at least getting your feet wet and becoming a more holistic doctor is always a good thing. Yeah, that's huge. And you, you alluded to a point. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, no, I, I was just going to say, I think that, you know, just having very clear goals of what you want in a rotation when you're doing that rotation helps. Um, sometimes it does take more of a, like a, a attending to attending discussion about it, but just, you know, if you want, if there's a certain rotation that's good that you like, for example, the neurology rotation, just 
having you know a very clear goal that hey from this rotation I'd like to be able to read you know the, the fusion weighted MR is better and I'd like to be able to quickly do an NH stroke scale for all these patients so that I can use this in my practice just you know having that kind of set out in front of you I can make this less kind of less dependent month to month based on who's on that rotation in terms of the the um, I guess the rest of the team or the the the, uh, the residents on that rotation. But I think that helps just to say like, okay, we're gonna go into this rotation, we're gonna come out with this information. Yeah, that's a great point. I think as a trainee, an early trainee, you really have to be proactive in your training. Did I lose you guys? Uh, your your video uh, is uh, frozen. frozen. But yeah, basically, oh. yeah, like you yeah. said, um, being much more proactive, I think you see residents who succeed and residents who fail, and the residents who succeed are way more proactive in terms of taking on opportunities. You know, being, you know, just just being ready to take on all the opportunities that are given to them, and being prepared for the rotation or for the case or for anything, any aspect of being a resident. So, I think that's a more of a global picture. But I think, you know, residents early on they need to be a lot more proactive about their own education and not just kind of expect things to be falling into their lap and, you know, getting to operate and things like that. The more you put into it, the more you get out. Yeah. One thing we, we pride ourselves at Methodist in our training program is, is kind of being a resident-driven uh, program where we really try to listen to our residents and we have a program evaluation committee and we meet very regularly and have evaluations on our rotations. And as you mentioned, rotations are not always great and they sometimes can, can get worse or get better with time. And having a program where the residents have input as to what rotations were good, what rotations are not so good, um, what needs to change, and having a program that's flexible enough to be able to accommodate that input and be able to change rotations, take rotations off, come up with new rotations. I think it's huge and, and in my opinion, when applicants are interviewing, um, they should inquire about what the protocol is for changing rotations and if a resident is unhappy with the rotation or if several residents have had a bad experience with the rotation, um, how that gets handled uh, and whether it's you're just stuck, this is the way our program runs and this is the way our rotation schedule is, or whether residents have a, an input and, and are able to change that. Uh, I think that's really, really important. Let's talk about uh, another topic that's, I think, crucial for the training experience of residents as they go through training, and that's general surgery. Um, as, as we know, we all have uh, you know, requirement to do general surgery during our integrative vascular uh, training and w when I started it was 24 months and I think it's now been decreased to 18 months and there's some talk about it potentially being decreased to 12 months but uh, this is kind of an evolving thing but how important is the general surgery uh, situation the relationship with the general surgery department and what what are some things that you should ask as an applicant about the general surgery rotations? And and I'll start with uh, you, Phil. Yeah, um, I I think that knowing how they span your months on general surgery is very important. Uh, again, whether they front load or they they disperse it out through all your years. You know, if you go to a general surgery rotation like trauma, like we do as a four, you're essentially as a chief there, and, and being a chief on the service is much different than being an intern on the service. So you get a lot more. Uh, out of it if, if you go in later in your years. So I think it's much better uh, just training paradigm if you spread your general surgery out throughout your years and sprinkle it in rather than front load it because as we said earlier if you're just going as an intern you're usually just there to do help them with notes and, and all that but um, and I think it's still important you know even though we do 18 months or 24 months it's still important to see their aspect of it because we still work pretty close with general surgery. Uh, you say you do a, acute mesenteric ischemia with frank bowel necrosis and you, you know, you're working with them and they're excising or resecting the dead bowel and, and so you know, there's a collegial atmosphere and, and you should know generally what they're doing on their side you know, just as becoming a better doctor overall. So it shouldn't be completely removed. I think you should still learn from what they do and you can learn from how they do something and adapt it to your practice too. That's how fields evolve. They continue to learn from other places and 
uh, not just stay inbred or just like this is the way it's always been. You can always change the way things are done. So, I mean, that's that's the beauty of vascular surgery, right? Uh, you can you can fix one pro one problem five different ways, and there's always a new way to do it, and you can pull that experience from anywhere. Dr. Liu? Yeah, no, I, I agree with Philip. I think it's definitely better for it to be kind of spread out through um, the years of training um, for speaking for integrated presence. I mean, I think that's better if it's not all front-loaded, just also so that you get some interaction with your uh, vascular department during the first couple of years or first 18 months, because otherwise you're kind of off secluded um, for 18 months, and then you know you only see the kind of the junior resident side of things from a general surgery perspective, and you never get to see kind of the chief level or the upper level um, cases and decision making and process and thinking from the attendings. Um, you know, I think that it's I don't think it's ever really going to go away where we don't have any general surgery because vascular, you know, vascular surgery and general surgery very much integrated and tied together. In fact, uh, you know, when I was a medical student, the general surgery program predominantly was operating with the vascular surgery staff. I know it's not that way in a lot of programs now, but that's what, I mean, that's what got me into vascular surgery to begin with because during my general surgery clerkship, so much of general surgery was vascular surgery at this particular location. Um, so, you know, I think that just spreading it out and I would I like programs that uh, spread it out throughout the years so that you can see the full breadth of general surgery and the different things they do, and I think there's definitely advantages to that. And, you know, I I don't know about how much more decreasing we do, but I don't think it that would I really ever, ever go away. Yeah, and and to add to that, I think another thing that applicants should look for are um, programs where you have a community general surgery experience as well. So one thing that's really, we've found in our program uh, as we've kind of worked the rotations out that has been very beneficial to our residents was to actually send our junior residents uh, out into the community and work with community general surgeons. Because when they're here at the medical center, you know, at a tertiary care center with uh, competing for cases with the fifth year and fourth year general surgery residents, um, they tend to not get the best cases, they potentially may not get to operate as much. However, when they go out into the community and it's just them and a general surgery attending, um, more like an apprenticeship model, even our second year uh, residents get a ton of operating, you know, they get a ton of x laps, they get to do lap coles, and I think that experience has been uh, really kind of key in, in providing our integrated vascular residents with a robust general surgery experience. And I think the other thing that you can, you can ask the programs when you um, talk to them to see them for that regard is just like what type of um, cases are the general surgery residents doing? Because it's, it's also if your general surgery program is very strict and, you know, there are still some programs where you don't operate as an intern. And, you know, if, you're, if your general surgery program is structured like that, which were, would work fine for general surgery residents, it may not work as well for an integrated vascular resident that only has 18 months to rotate on general surgery. So, you know, you can just ask them how the, the general surgery program is ran as well. That might give you some insight on what you'd be doing with those rotations. So we have a question uh, here, and if anybody else has any other questions, please feel free to text DeBakey to 37607. And the, the question we have from a member of our audience is, uh, any advice for a DO student? Should I even bother trying integrated or just go through general surgery? Um, so I'll, I'll give that one to start off with, uh, Dr. Liu. What, what, what do you think about DO student applying to integrated vascular? I mean, I think that um, you should definitely apply if you're interested. There's, you know, having um, been on the, in the review side of a, a couple of different institutions now, I mean, we don't, you know, we, we don't, there's not a no DO policy for sure. We consider you in the same breath as everyone else. We look at your app, uh, your scores, your letters of recommendations. 
Um, we look at um, how, how you did throughout your clerkship. We also, you know, we look at your personal statement as well, and all those things are taken into consideration. And we also take into consideration your interests that you've had, um, whether it's research or volunteer or, or where your overall practice goals are, um, are after you graduate. And we take all those things into consideration both before, you know, we send out the invitation and when we talk to you. So, you know, I don't think that that's definitely a no, what just you're as a competitive as an MD. You just, uh, you know, we just want to find the best applicant and not, not an MD or not a DO, just the best applicant. Mm -hmm. Philip? Yeah, yeah, I think uh, DO doesn't have that much uh, weight in terms of, you know, not having a chance. I think if you have decent board scores, I think in all fields, it's does your board scores meet a certain criteria or certain level and then once you get into that then they start looking into your all your other um, academics and and uh, outside activities and, and letters of recs and those are all pretty important um, so it's like a certain threshold in terms of board scores once you get past that then then they start looking to your application more closely so I don't think DO has any any real factor into that I know our, our ex incoming fellow is a DO so um, you know, I don't think it makes too much difference. I think if you're really motivated, you should definitely go for vascular surgery. Yeah. And I mean, and sorry, and I was just going to add that I've def we've definitely interviewed DOs before. I mean, I've interviewed DOs before. I've interviewed um, for medical grads before to, based on just really stellar applications. So, you know, we've, I don't think that anything is a definite no as long as, you know, you have the, the scores for it and you have the letters of support for it and you know you show that you've had an interest these years as a med student. Yeah, I, I would definitely echo that. Uh, well, you know, I, I have heard of, of programs out there, not just in vascular, but other fields of, of potentially um, kind of filtering between MD and DO. I think in general, most programs don't and um, having a good mentor, I think is key. Uh, so. It's hard to to tell somebody that just you know because they're an MD or a DO or because their board score is this or that that they're ruled in or ruled out um, from vascular surgery, especially integrated vascular surgery. I found that it's such a dynamic uh, application uh, kind of cycle because it's such a new field that the competitiveness of the integrated vascular surgery. Uh, varies a lot from year to year so it's, it's you know some years is extremely competitive and and the match rate is low and then some years it's not as competitive so i think having a good mentor and having a good uh, person a vascular surgeon or somebody who who is a program director or somebody who has experience with the, the vascular surgery match having them look at your application and, and being able to uh, look at the whole application uh, to include your uh, interest and research and extracurriculars and board scores and grades and all that stuff. I think um, that's that's really important when thinking about applying. Uh, so uh, another question is any red flags uh, that applicants should be looking for? So as they're applying, I know it's certainly much harder now that most interviews are going to be via uh, Zoom or, or another platform, uh, another virtual platform. It's much harder to get a, an idea of what the program's like and what the residents are like, but uh, wh what do you think, Philip? Any red flags uh, applicants should look for? Um, particular red flags, I mean, I think if, if they don't do certain types of operations, like they don't do any dialysis access or they don't really do much open vascular, those are red flags. If the residents just don't seem very happy, <laughs> that's a red flag. And uh, if you can get a sense of the personality or the type of fit that you have with them, I think your fit with the program is also probably, if number one is case volume, number two is your fit person in the personality-wise with the program. Because you want to enjoy where you train. It's your five to six, seven years of your life, and you want to actually enjoy it and who you work with. So. Um, you know, if you just don't get a good vibe from the, the interviews or they don't, you don't seem to see, eye, see eye to eye on, on things, even just personal things uh, outside of medicine, then maybe it's not a great fit for you. Dr. Liu, red flags for you in program. Red flag for, for me or for the pro for in the program? <laughs> in your opinion, uh, for the applicants, that uh, red flags they should be looking for. I think... 
I mean, I think that they should look and see how happy the residents are, kind of like what Philip says. And it's it's harder now via Zoom, but it's, and then for those um, people that, you know, I, and again, this year is just different. But I would normally say if you really are interested in coming up like, to a place, then you know, do in a way rotation there and see how it is because it's it's very easy for everyone to smile and be happy for a day or a few hours, but it's very hard to be like that for a month or four weeks or however long you're there. So that's what I would usually say for a program that you really like and you really want to be a part of. Um, I think just really the residents tell you what's going on. I think that all the programs really you're going to get kind of, you know, the numbers you need to become a vascular surgeon. So I'm less worried about just the overall numbers that you'd see, because I think that everyone's going to show you good numbers too, because you're only going to get the numbers that they're going to show you. And no one is going to show you numbers in the red. So I think it's really just how you interact with the, um, the residents and with you. I mean, I've had a couple of interviews when I was applying for a residency where, you know, I really just didn't like the interview and it was, it was really, it was awkward. Parts of it was kind of mean, you know, like the resident, the interviewees talked to each other and then, you know, some of them really weren't happy with how they were treated during the interview for one reason or another. So, I mean, I think that, you know, see how you feel talking to residents, talking to the staff that interviews you, talk to other people that interviewed there and see what their thoughts were. You know, so, you know, if they're not capable of being nice to, to everybody the day that they interview people, then maybe that's not the nicest place to be. Yeah, that fit, that fit is really important. And for me, I think when I was applying to vascular uh, residency, I, I wanted a place that was busy. So to me, uh, you know, program where people were saying, oh, it's really chill, or, you know, we don't, we don't operate that much, or uh, it's not that busy, or it's kind of light. Um, that was kind of a red flag for me. I, you know, you have five years to kind of learn as much vascular surgery as you possibly can. It's a huge field. We operate all over the body, you know, from the base of the neck to the toes and um, everywhere in between. And so being, having, you know, that huge volume of information to learn, as well as learning to operate, um, I think you want a program that's busy and, and ideally, you know, your vascular surgery residency would be uh, busy enough where you're constantly learning and, and uh, not, not to the point where you're overwhelmed or overworked or abused, but uh, you want a busy program. You want a, a program with high volume. Um, and we'll, we'll finish. And you want to, and I would say you want a busy program, but you also want time. You know, I think it's also important that you have time as well to plan and to talk about things ahead of time. You know, you don't want to just be drinking from a, a fire hydrant the whole time. You know, it's sometimes at some point, you know, you definitely need the volume, but at some point you also need the, like the attention of the faculty and the team members to actually to go through cases and to plan things ahead of time and figure out what you're going to do, especially with the complex endovascular cases. I mean, the complex endovascular cases, a lot more of it is with the pre-planning than it is <laughs> intraoperatively sometimes. Yeah. Intraop time really depends on how much you did to pre-plan for it. Yep, that's a, that's a great point. You want faculty who are dedicated to teaching, uh, faculty who have time uh, to teach residents, and uh, it, that's hard to gauge, obviously, as an applicant, but uh, you know, asking your asking the residents at the program, you know, how often do you sit down with the faculty and go over the case before you do it, and 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 you know, being being at a place where the faculty take the time to do that is is crucial. So, I I really want to thank you both for the discussion. You guys all made some really excellent points, and thank you so much for your time. I know that applicants out there uh, will really benefit from the advice you guys have have given them. Uh, any last points, any closing remarks? Um, we'll, we'll start with Philip. <laughs> um, I don't know. I guess my, my final point that I want to say is that if you're, if you're choosing between general surgery and integrated vascular or any specialty, I'd say choose the specialty surgery and don't do general surgery. <laughs> it's not fun. You want to go somewhere and you have the support and, and people are happier in the specialties than they are in general surgery. And that's just how I feel and, and how I've seen it. I'm sure that there's specific programs that are great, but you know I feel like integrated vascular is a close knit um, program, and it's a close knit society, and you kind of feel a part of something, and uh, that's what I liked about it. Thank you, Dr. Lin. 
I'd say, you know, choose, if we're talking about choosing whether integrated vascular or general surgery or whatnot, I'd say choose whatever, you know, whatever you feel like you'd be the best fit for and whatever interests you the most. You know, what drove me to vascular, and even though I was, I know it's kind of negative about the uh, the complex of vascular, is that I love technology and I love the integration that Vaster has always done with technology, and we're very rap we're very eager and very good at embracing new technologies. And you know, that's why I'm interested in Vaster, and I think that's why I'm going to be interested in Vaster for years to come because we always are integrating new things like VIVARs, ascending stent graphs, TAMI devices. I think all these things are coming. It's getting more and more complex, and we do on-table CT scans now, which I didn't know existed before. So you know, all these. All these things will keep me interested in Vaster, and you should pick the specialty and pick the program that's going to, you know, going to be best for your interests. Thank you. Thank you. That's great advice. All right, folks. Well, join us next time on uh, Debakey CV Live.